The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you guys. I'm Aries from GeneScript Marketing Department, and I appreciate your coming to our talk hosted by GeneScript on title Expression of Toxic Genes in E. coli, Special Strategies and G Genetic Tools. It is really my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Fang Long Zhao. Dr. Zhao is a senior scientist at GeneScript who is specialized in the field of metabolic engineering and synthetic biology. He has extensive experience in assembly of long DNA fragments. In this webinar, we will discuss how to identify and predict the presence of toxic genes in molecular cloning experience and review several methods and genetic tools to ensure successful execution of your experience for obtaining reliable results. Now, let's welcome Dr. Zhao. If you have any questions during the presentation, please tap in the chat box. Dr. Zhao will reply it at the end of the presentation. Hi, Aries. Thank you for your introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Fang Long, and I am responsible for synthetic biology research and development in GeneScript. Today, the topic of this webinar is how to express toxic genes in an E. coli expression system. The webinar is structured in three parts. In the first part, we will talk about what kind of genes are toxic to the host. In the second part, we will describe how to predict if certain genes are toxic. And in the last part, we will describe some methods and tools to clone, for cloning toxic genes in E. coli. Now, let's start from the first part, the definition of toxic gene. E. coli is the most widely used host for synthetic biology, metabolic engineering, protein production, or plasmid replication. With the advent of the post-genome era, this bacterium is needed to express a growing number of genes originating from different organisms. Unfortunately, many of these genes severely interfere the survival of E. coli cells. They tend to cause metabolic burden, cell death, or significant defects in bacteria, bacteria growth. Therefore, a toxic gene is defined here as a gene or gene products cause severe cultivation defects or cell deaths. So you may be wondering why do these genes exhibit toxic effects to the host cell? The main reason is that gene expression of a functional protein often adversely affects the viability of the host cell. Here, we have summarized some type of highly toxic protein that we often encounter. A rice polyprotein and the glycoprotein hem, hem gluteny are toxic to E. coli, probably due to membrane destabilization. For example, the hem gluteny process a specific affinity for certain sugar molecules. Since sugar exists in most cell membranes, the heme glutenes may attach to these receptor growths and affect membrane function. In addition, some membrane proteins, ion channels or transporter, will also disturb membrane function, resulting in cell toxicity. High expression of nucleus in a host cell will decrease or degrade DNA, resulting in chromosome destabilization. And another example are some enzymes associated with cell replication and some proteins like kinase, toxin, transposes, and integrase may in fact interfere cell growth, result in cell toxicity. It is estimated that about 80% of all soluble recombinant proteins 
give a certain degree of toxicity to the host. And about 10% of these proteins are considered highly toxic to host cells. So protein toxicity is a commonly observed phenomenon. There are several problems when subcloned DNA con contains toxic genes. You can find that there are fewer colonies than those in regular cloning experiment. And sometimes the target DNA fragment contains a mutation or some DNA parts are missing. A more severe problem is that there are no colony in cloning experiment. I believe some of you must have encountered these situations before. Usually we attribute it to the low efficiency of DNA assembly. From now on, please also double check if your DNA fragment contains toxic genes. At this time, you may have a question. How would I know if my gene of interest is a toxic gene? So in the next part, we will answer this question. Fortunately, there is a database that can help us predict toxic genes. It is called the PandaTox database, and it includes thousands of toxic genes. The full name of PandaTox database is a pan-genomatic database for genomatic element toxic to bacteria. This database aims at identifying genes and uh, intergenic regions that are unclonable in E. coli. It is also designed to improve the efficiency of metabolic engineering by systematically identifying enzymes whose products are toxic to E. coli. Pandertox holds and presents a set of about 40,000 genes and maybe that may be toxic to bacteria. These genes are the result of a computational analysis performed on about 400 microbial genomes. These genes are categorized according to their catalytic function. The left figure demonstrates the families of genes that inhibit E. coli growth when cloned into it use plasmid vector. I apologize if this figure is a little blurry, but you can find this figure in the Pender Talks database for more information. Also, the slide will be available on GeneScript website for you to download after the webinar. Okay, when you want to know whether your gene or proteins are toxic to the host, you can search and blast your DNA sequences in this database. Check who the homologs of these toxic genes and whether these homologs are toxic as well. In this slide, I, will, I would like to give you an example and show you how to use PandaTox database to predict toxic genes. It, it is an easy and user-friendly software to use. First, you will need to paste your DNA sequence in the box, select BlastN and the PandaTox database, PandaTox gene collection. Alternatively, you can also paste your protein sequence, select BlastP and the PandaTox protein, protein collection. After a few minutes for searching, you can get the result. Here we pasted a DNA sequence as an example, then click blast button. Let's see what will happen next. We can see the results in a new web page. The result will tell you if the production of your DNA sequence is uh, homologous with the DNA or proteins in this database. For we search the sequence, it shows that four gene, four gene productions are included. It will also give you the identity between query and homolog sequence in the database and the organism of the homolog. The most important information for us is the gene 
clonability analysis. In this case, three genes show normal, which means that this gene can be cloned into E. coli. However, for the third one, it shows unclonable, which means it is a great probability that the gene cannot be cloned into E. coli. This result is consistent with our experiment date. We have paid great effort to clone this DNA fragment into a vector. Here you may have another question. Once the toxicity of a gene is determined, what kind of strategies and tools could be used to clone this toxic gene into a plasmid? Next, I will show you some special strategies and tools. Generally, we can use two kinds of strategies in order to clone a toxic gene. For the first one, we can use different genetic tools to suppress toxic protein expression. These genetic tools include, include the use of a tightly regulated promoter or terminator and the manipulation of the plasmid copy number. We will also discuss the use of MRI switch mechanism and the CRISPR DCAS9 to tightly control the trans translatability of highly toxic gene MRIs. For the, second, for, for the second strategy, we will discuss special culture method that were also developed for cloning toxic genes in E. coli. Okay, now let's get into the details. Tight control of transcription and translation is the first key for a successful expression of highly toxic genes in E. coli. The main goal of this solution is to enable E. coli cells to suppress, suppress, suppress toxic gene expression during the growth phase, growth phase. After induction, efficient expression signals will ensure rapid production of the highly toxic protein before the cell dies. This strategy has been extensively used to express toxic protein. In our company, we also use this method for plasmid amplification. Now, let's take a look at the method using tightly regulated promoter. Many promoters are not very tightly regulated and show some basic expression before the addition of the inducer. For example, T7 lag promoter is the most commonly used strong promoter. However, expression of expression in the T7 based system tend to be leaky, which is problematic for the expression of toxic protein. And often this leakiness leads to loss of plasmid. But this problem can be resolved by presence of PLYS S or PLYSE plasmid. These two plasmid, these two plasmid are able to express T7 lysozyme. T7 lysozyme binds to T7 RNAP and inhibits T7 promoter transcription. After induction, the amount of T7 RNAP produce, produced surprise level of polymerase that T7 lysozyme can inhibit. The free T7 RNAP can thus engage in transcription of the recombinant gene. And of course, you can also use PBAD promoter for tightly regulated expression. PBAD is regulated by the addition and the absence of arobinols. Without arobinols, the PBAD and PC promoters are repressed by protein ARAC. In the presence of arobinols, transcription from the PBD promoter is turned on. In its absence, transcription occurs at very low level. Sometimes, although the transcription system is highly 
suppressed. Leaky transcription of the extremely toxic gene is still lethal to the host. Therefore, it is necessary to take measures to prevent the translation of the leaky mRNA. Antisense transcription occurs counter to gene orientation and the promoter oriented opposite to genes can produce antisense RNA by directing antisense transcription. Antisense RNA has been widely used to regu regulate gene expression. The mechanism of antisense RNA regulation depends on RNA and RNA interaction. The, bind, the binding of antisense RNA to its target mRNAs forms an RNA secondary structure that inhibits ribosome binding. Here is a case using antisense transcription design for toxic gene expression control. In this design, we want to express a restriction in the nucleus BAMH1 in E. coli. The transcription of this toxic gene is controlled by T7 like pro promoter to block the translation of the leaky MRI. The trap transcription system for controlled RNA interfere interference is used. In the absence of IPTG and uh, tryptophan, the toxic gene is transcribed at a basic level and the antisense RNA is highly transcribed by TRIP promoter, leading to the blocking of the leaky mRNA translation in E. coli. In the presence of IPTG and tryptophan, antisense transcription is blocked and the toxic gene is efficiently expressed. And of course, you can also use crispr d cas interference. The inactive Cas9, we call DCAS9 protein, combined with guide RNA as a DNA targeting platform, could be used to modulate gene expression in bacteria. This interference system could be used for multi site gene expression repressing. If several toxic genes are simultaneously expressed, you can try this method. Like the leaky expression of the promoter, read-through expression should also be prevented. Read-through transcription occurs when you have a strong promoter located upstream of the highly toxic gene. The transcription will continue beyond the normal terminator signal and your toxic gene will be transcribed. This means if you are cloning a strong promoter and you do not have an efficient terminator to stop transcription, the polymerase will read through or proceed beyond the stop signal. To bypass this limitation, you need to have a very good terminator to prevent this ex excess transcription. You can put a strong transcription terminator between the promoter sequence and your toxic gene sequence. It was possible not only to maintain this toxic gene in E. coli, but also to express substantial amounts of the enzyme after induction. E. coli RNBT1 and T2 are two terminators commonly used for this purpose. Another, commonly, another common strategy to express toxic genes is to maintain clones at low copy number in growth phase, then induce to high copy number for improved plasmid yield. I think all of us commonly used CoE1 type plasmid in our experiment. CoE1 initiation of replication relies on the formation RNA termed RNA2. RNA2 form, form the stable RNA and DNA hybrid with the leading strand DNA template. However, 
The caller host will also transcribe RNA1, which is a counter transcription to this section of RNA2 and so binds to its five prominent. The replication is slowed down due to generation RNA1, and thus the copy number could be maintained at a low level. If we want to get high copy number, we can express PCMB protein in vivo. PCMB promotes an annihilation of antisense RNA1, and thus promotes degradation of RNA1. After that, we can get high copy number in host cells. In this slide, I want to show you another case for copy number manipulation. Some times ago, I got an order for DNA synthesis. This DNA sequence contains an exonucleus expression cassette. At the beginning, it was cloned into a high copy plasmid. PUC57, but it failed. I could not, I could not find the correct clone colonies. Then this DNA sequence was cloned into a bacterial artificial chromosome vector. We often call it BAC. It is a single copy plasmid, which is usually used for cloning large DNA fragments. Here, I use this backbone for cloning the toxic gene and it worked. Finally, I got the correct colonies. This vector can also be used for copy number amplification. This back vector contains two replication origins. They are origin 2 and origin V. And it also contains SOP A, B, C for ensuring the back's stable maintenance. Normally, RAP E and ORI2 control the copy number at 1 to 2 copy per cell. For ORI V, it is the high copy origin of DNA replication. It needs the protein TRFA for DNA replication. ORI V is completely inactive in the commonly used host because it do not produce the TRFA protein. To supply this protein, we constructed special host in which synthesis of TRFA protein is very tightly controlled by the PBAD promoter. When aerobinose is added into the media, TRFA protein will generate and it will combine with OREV. Then we can get a yield of about 100 copies of the vector plus host cell. This method is robust and uh, reliable for manipulation of the copy number. In addition to these genetic tools, many E. coli hosts have been developed for cloning toxic gene, and they each present excellent performance in different ways. Here, I want to single out string STBL3 copy cutter EPI400 and C41 or C43 as examples. The STBL3 E. coli string is derived from the HB101 E. coli string. In this string, recombinase RECA is mutated. So, um, the recombination is inhibited. It could be used to clone direct repeat and tandem array genes. The copy cutter EPI400 cell was created by manipulating a gene that controls the copy number of vector contains CoE1 or OREV replication origins. This constitutively expressed gene PCNB was deleted from the parental string and replaced with a modified PCMB gene linked to an inducible promoter, creating the EPI400 string. The copy number of e CoE1 type vector in the EPI, EP1400 string compared to the parental string is about 
four to 25 fold lower. We can use it to clone and maintain challenge sequence and re at a reduced plasmid copy number, then induce the strain for high copy numbers for DNA recovery. EPI 400 strain also includes a TRFA expression cassette in genome. As I mentioned above, this element can be used to control ORIV type plasmid copy number. The strain C41 was derived from BL21. C41 had at least one mutation, which pre prevent their deaths associated with expression of several recombinant toxic proteins at once. The strain C43 was derived from C41 by selecting for resistance to a different toxic protein and can express a different set of toxic proteins to C41. These two strains appear to be useful in some toxic proteins, especially some membrane proteins. And here is a rare case for high expression of membrane proteins, YIDC. Figure A shows that YIDC is toxic to the E. coli cell, thereby preventing, preventing biomass formation. For unknown reason, overexpression of these membrane proteins in C41 and C43 strain is less toxic, resulting in high overexpression yield. At last, I will show you an easy but efficient method to improve plasmid stability. You can grow your E. coli at a low temperature. But why? This is because toxic protein is less active under lower temperature. This method has a major drawback, as we all know. Growth rate of the E. cell slows down under low temperature, and it needs about two days to obtain your strain. But sometimes you have to do this if you want to successfully clone a highly toxic gene. Okay, let's make a summary. Today we talk about how to identify and predict toxic genes in our cloning experiment. Then I provided you with some special method and genetic tools to ensure your project goes smoothly. You can use several genetic tools to suppress toxic gene expression. As alternative options, you can consider using special E. coli hosts and a culturing method for cloning toxic genes. It is important to note that these methods are not universal to clone all of the toxic genes. You should try to find the best one for yours. In addition, combinations of several methods are often needed in order to express a highly toxic gene. Okay, good luck to your experiment. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you for Dr. Zhao's presentation. You can find the relevant information through our web website, www.genescript.com. And I have got some questions from our, our audience. The, the first one is, um, hello, Dr. Zhao, I want to clone a large DNA fragments from E. coli genome. It is about uh, 20 to 30 KB. Do you think if the plasmid will be stable in E. coli? I mean, uh, will recombination occur between E. coli genome and the DNA sequence in plasmid? Okay, thank you for your question. I think it is possible that the recombination will occur. But you can use some special E. coli host. I recommend STBL3 strain because the recombinant rec A is deleted in, this, in its genome. So recombination probably probability will decrease. And good luck to you. Thank you. OK, I have an, uh, another question. So I want to synthesize a, a virus genome. It is about uh, 41 KB in length. And I think it must be toxic to E. coli. Does your company ever have ever synthesized this kind of gene before? 
Oh, uh, okay. I would say the answer is definitely yes. We have assembled many gene construct larger than 100 KB. So it's okay for us to assemble 41 KB genome. Recently, we successfully synthesized several rice genomes for different clients. And indeed, some of these rice genome present, present toxic, toxicity to E. coli host. But this limitation could be bypassed using the method I mentioned above. So we can provide this kind of service. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zhao. And due to time limitations, this webinar will be ended up soon. Please do not hesitate to, to call or email us if you have any questions, including but not limited to this webinar and GeneScript one-stop services from gene synthesis to antibody drug discovery and development. And our technical, techni technical manager will get back to you within 24 hours. Thank you again for attending this webinar. I look forward I look forward to hearing from you soon. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.